Welcome everyone to this webinar, Seasonal Influenza 2020-2021, NACI and AMI Canada recommendations in the context of COVID-19. My name is Alexandra Wierzbowski and I am with the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases. I will be your moderator today. NCCID is funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada to provide knowledge and evidence for use in public health planning and policy. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that NCCID is located on the original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene's people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and the mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. There are just few housekeeping items I would like to mention. We are running this webinar through Zoom platform and we will be using the Q&A tab during the Q&A period following the presentation. Please take a moment to look, locate your Q&A tab now. Please submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab at any point during the presentation and the Q&A. You can like other people's questions to push them up in priority. We are also live streaming this webinar through the University of Manitoba for those who might be having challenges with Zoom. If you are watching through the live stream, you can email your questions to our speakers to nccid at umanitoba.ca. If you have any technical problems or other questions uh, for our NCCID team, please email us at nccid at umanitoba .ca. We will do our best to assist you. Lastly, I would like to mention that the recording of this webinar will be available on the NCCID website as well as emailed to all registrants afterwards. Today's webinar will provide frontline healthcare providers and public health vaccine providers with the information they need to support their practice during the 2020-2021 influenza COVID-19 season. The presentation will begin with an overview of the burden of influenza last year in Canada and the late, latest epidemiological trends both nationally and internationally in the context of COVID-19 pandemic by Dr. Gerald Evans. Following Dr. Evans, we will have Dr. Ian Gamble present the latest NACI recommendations on the seasonal influenza vaccine use for this year's flu season. Next, we will hear from Dr. Robin Harrison. Dr. Robin Harrison will present the latest recommendations on the delivery of influenza vaccine during COVID-19 pandemic. Subsequently, we will have Dr. Evans sum summarize AMI Canada recommendations on the use of antiviral drugs for this year's seasonal influenza. Lastly, Dr. Gamel will conclude the presentation with the key messages and important resources about seasonal influenza. Following their presentations, speakers will be available to answer your questions. Please submit your questions through Q&A tab in Zoom. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Gerald Evans is the Chair of the Division of Infectious Diseases and a Professor in the Department of Medicine at Queen's University and an attending Infectious Disease Physician at Kingston Health Sciences Centre. He is a member of the AMI Canada Influenza Working Group, which has authored a number of guidelines on the management of influenza. Dr. Ian Gamel is the past chair of NACI's Influenza Working Group. He is a member of World Health Organization Immunization Practices Advisory Committee and is the liaison member to its Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety. Dr. Gemmel is a graduate of Faculty of Medicine, Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario, and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in Public Health and Preventive Medicine. Dr. Robin Harrison is an adult infectious disease specialist and a clinical professor at the University of Alberta. She's also a provincial communicable disease consultant for Alberta Health Services Workplace Health and Safety Program and a member of Alberta Advisory Committee on Immunization. She's a member of NACI, a member of NACI High Consequence Infectious Disease Working Group and chair for the NACI Influenza Working Group. With this, we will start our presentation with a look at the burden of seasonal influenza presented by Dr. Gerald Evans. 
Uh, thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, so as has uh, been the case in the last couple of years, we're going to start off with a quick overview of uh, the burden of seasonal influenza in Canada with a review of uh, general information as well as last year's uh, data. So as everyone knows, uh, in a typical year, there are a large number of hospitalizations and deaths which can be attributable to influenza uh, in Canada every year. Uh, this year, however, is almost certainly going to be different as many of the uh, of you who are listening know we are facing a pandemic of COVID-19 and so the predictability of what's going to happen with seasonal influenza is a little bit more challenging. We have recognized for years that there are high risk groups uh, with susceptibility to influenza illness uh, and those can be due to either individual characteristics and or uh, living or working environment which may present a greater risk for influenza transmission. Uh, in general, we know that there are groups uh, who are uh, very commonly developing serious complications as a result of influenza infection, and that includes young children, uh, pregnant women, uh, those with chronic health conditions, including common conditions like diabetes mellitus, uh, as well as those that are living in nursing homes and other chronic care facilities, and of course, people over the age of 65. If we look at the high-risk chronic health conditions in a little bit more detail, uh, it's a fairly extensive list which we um, have uh, recognized now for many years. Those with cardiac pulmonary disorders, diabetes, as previously mentioned, those who may be immunocompromised either, either for treatment for cancer or other underlying diseases, those with chronic renal uh, disease um, uh, patients and individuals with uh, hematological issues like anemia or hemoglobinopathies, uh, those with neurologic and neurodevelopmental disorders, and uh, unfortunately more commonly these days those who have significant uh, obesity as measured by a BMI of over 40. And we also recognize that children uh, in the younger age group uh, and into adolescents who are undergoing chronic treatment with uh, ASA may be at potential risk because of uh, Rye syndrome, which uh, is associated with influenza. Um, what we now know as we've uh, well into eight to nine months of COVID-19 worldwide in the pandemic is that high risk groups for influenza and COVID-19 uh, can overlap significantly. And the same characteristics which put people at risk for COVID-19 uh, are also risk factors for uh, influenza, uh, including those that may make the patient more susceptible or to develop more severe or complicated disease. Uh, there are a few exceptions, however. We do know that younger children, in particular, uh, do not have a higher risk of severe COVID-19 infection in general, although cases have been described. And to date, at least, uh, the data on whether pregnant women may be at higher risk for COVID-19 infection uh, is still um, undergoing examination, uh, and so there is some uncertainty. We do recognize, however, that pregnant women are at higher risk for severe or complicated influenza disease. Um, and one of the things, of course, that we know is that COVID-19 and influenza are very much expected to co-circulate uh, this fall and into the uh, uh, seasonal flu season over winter. And we don't understand at the moment what the risk of co-infection with influenza and COVID-19 uh, are at this time, uh, but we may uh, be able to uh, learn a little bit more of that as we progress through our season. Um, if you look at uh, data that we have from Canada, this is data going back to the 2014-15 uh, uh, seasonal uh, flu uh, time period. Uh, you can see that uh, on generally speaking, the period of time for seasonal influenza starts in the uh, late fall and extends out to the uh, early and sometimes mid spring. Uh, last year, the peak of influenza disease occurred early in March and then dramatically dropped off um, as was seen in a number of uh, jurisdictions, uh, likely due to the onset of COVID-19 and precautions that were being put in place to prevent transmission of the pandemic virus. Um, we know each year that the portion of uh, influenza type and subtypes varies. Again, here you're looking at data from 2014-15 uh, season out to uh, two years ago. And you can see in any given year, there may be a predominance either of something like uh, H1N1 influenza A, H3N2 um, influenza A, or in fact, influenza B. And so uh, that can be sometimes very difficult to predict. Uh, and we only know after we start uh, getting isolates that we can uh, then have undergo uh, typing and subtyping. 
Um, the Canadian influenza season last year, uh, we have uh, some reasonable data on thanks to the flu watch program which collects and analyzes data from across the country, uh, as well as reports that come from provincial public health agencies and, and hospitals uh, through their laboratory uh, testing, as well as a sentinel surveillance program. Uh, a reminder that uh, if you're looking for information during the year, you should go to the uh, flu watch webpage where there is a weekly surveillance report uh, issued um, uh, uh, every week to give you an idea of where influenza is active in Canada. Uh, and as well, you'll be receiving information, should be receiving information from your public health units to tell you if influenza has entered into uh, your community. Um, COVID-19 has affected some of their surveillance data and that's chiefly around the fact that many laboratories and certainly public health is at the moment uh, quite occupied with um, developing and uh, surveying and watching uh, for changes in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and we also know that COVID-19 is likely to change healthcare seeking behavior um, amongst uh, the public in general and is going to have an impact on influenza uh, testing capacity. Um, last year, influenza A was the predominant circulating virus late in the season uh, and H1N1 was the predominant subtype. Uh, however, all uh, the both influenza A strains, the H1N1 and H3N2 strains, as well as influenza B, were all co-circulating to varying degrees. Uh, the influenza activity, as I showed you in the previous graph, showed a peak in January, February, but dropped off rapidly, uh, likely due to all the social distancing that was um, uh, introduced around the time of COVID-19 into the mid to late March period. Um, and since that time, influenza activity has been at a record low in Canada for the later part of the typical season that we tend to see um, with the percentage of tests positive for influenza, uh, the lowest recorded in the last nine seasons. Uh, this is just a, a quick uh, figure to show, so show the number of laboratory detections of influenza around, uh, around the country and by province. Uh, and uh, the graph uh, here or the pie chart show you uh, whether they were unsubtyped A's, uh, H3N2, H1N1 or influenza B. And you can see here that influenza B certainly uh, popped up. Uh, in, in almost all territories and a number of uh, subtyping uh, hasn't been completed to sort of look at the generation of H3N2 versus H1N1. But in provinces that have done uh, a great deal of those numbers, we can see that uh, H1N1 tended to predominate. Um, this is just a, another graphic display by influenza type and subtype uh, for last season's uh, reports. Uh, and here you can see that very dramatic drop off in influenza activity activity or at least tests that were uh, being uh, processed and, and recorded at that time. Uh, at, and of course, the laboratories, certainly in public health, were very quickly and rapidly shifting over uh, to the detection of COVID-19. Um, visits to healthcare professionals uh, last year, uh, the last season of 2019-2020, uh, showed a peak uh, just uh, late in, the, in 2019, early uh, 2020. Um, and then that continued over a period of time, but did not completely drop off. And that was chiefly because there were now ongoing concerns about the potential for COVID-19. And so patients who had an influenza-like illness may have still been presenting for healthcare to, uh, to ascertain whether or not what they had was the flu or whether they had COVID-19. Uh, vaccine estimates from last year show that the vaccine was uh, quite remarkably effective in 58% uh, overall. Uh, and you can see the breakdown here by the different components of the trivalent vaccine, uh, and in some cases quadrivalent vaccine, uh, with good efficacy of 44% against H1N1, very good efficacy against H3N2 at 62%, and uh, with protection from B at 69%. Uh, this was a very important data because uh, early on in the season, we were very worried about the H3N2 component of the vaccine and whether or not it might affect the predominating strain, but clearly uh, there was a reasonable match uh, to what was circulating. Um, and it's important to remember that when we get uh, vi vaccine effectiveness estimates, they don't usually come out until later in the winter. Uh, so we're not going to really know about this year's vaccine until we start seeing data uh, into the sort of uh, February period. So I'm going to briefly just finish off with a discussion about the Southern Hemisphere uh, influenza season. Uh, it's always of interest because we uh, look to see if there are patterns emerging there that might reflect what we're going to see in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, but it does not necessarily predict what's going to happen in Canada. 
Uh, Australia's flu season, which is the, probably the largest uh, southern hemisphere country, although there are some in South America as well that are equally uh, populous, um, it typically starts in June. Um, and uh, was uh, going to sort of show us what was happening with the introduction of public health measures and COVID-19 uh, precautions globally. Um, and in fact, there's been a low influenza activity in the Southern Hemisphere in general this uh, year. Uh, and in particular, we have uh, good data from uh, Australia at the moment. It's important to remember though, that that impact on the influenza season may not necessarily have been the COVID-19 precautions. Uh, there were differences in the composition of the seasonal vaccine, and there was a remarkable increase in vaccine uptake for the flu shot um, in the Southern Hemisphere uh, this last winter for them. Uh, and in some states in Australia, there were reports of a 200% increase in people who were receiving the flu shot compared with uh, the previous year. Uh, the other thing we don't know about is viral interference that may arise from SARS-CoV-2, which is a known effect that can be seen with respiratory viruses. Um, and the other thing was is that many of the very intense public health measures to control COVID-19 were introduced closer to the start of the Southern Hemisphere season. And as everyone knows here, in fact, with uh, the summer, uh, there has been a gradual reopening and a reduction in some of the public health measures. Uh, so that may also uh, impact uh, where things are sitting. Um, the other thing to remember too is uh, Canada is a very different place when it comes to the winter season than in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, where many of the countries don't, don't have the extremes of temperature that may be seen uh, in Canada over the winter season. Um, and then this is my last slide, just to sort of show you uh, the number of laboratory confirmed cases in Australia, going back through the different seasons out to 2015, over six years, you can see the rise and peak in laboratory confirmed cases. This very shallow solid line here, which is in a ready pink, is actually what had has happened uh, up till uh, July where we had data. So uh, the Southern Hemisphere season has been remarkably quiet uh, and perhaps heralds uh, what we may be seeing uh, uh, here in uh, Canada uh, for our, uh, our flu season. So at this point, I'm going to uh, turn over the uh, slide deck to uh, Dr. Gemmel uh, and uh, let him uh, start talking about vaccine. Thank you, Gerald. And uh, thank you also to um, uh, for the opportunity to participate again this year in uh, this annual update on influenza vaccine for the 2020-21 influenza season. Um, I do appreciate all of the uh, uh, work that the people at MCCID and Public Health Agency of Canada have done who collaborated to make the session possible. So thanks for your help. Um, most of you uh, know that uh, NACI is an external advisory body to the Public Health Agency of Canada. It makes recommendations on the optimal use of all vaccines uh, that are licensed in this country and uh, definitely uses uh, an evidence-based process uh, to do so, both for individuals and for vaccine programs across Canada. And every year, NACI issues its statement on seasonal influenza vaccine that uh, uh, gives guidelines on the optimal use of the vaccine uh, based on the most up-to-date um, information that we have. This year as well, NACI is uh, also leading or collaborating on the development of additional uh, vaccine recommendations uh, in the context of uh, the novel uh, coronavirus. The, to remind you, uh, each year, it is the uh, World Health Organization uh, make recommendations for uh, the influenza vaccine that uh, should be in uh, the various vaccines in the Northern Hemisphere. It's, they do it for the Southern Hemisphere as well, but for our purposes, it's the Northern Hemisphere. And the recommendations that they made uh, for 2020-21 uh, uh, are for the trivalent vaccine, the A Guangdong, H1N1-like virus, uh, H, uh, A Hong Kong, H3N2-like virus, and B Washington of the Victoria lineage. Um, you will uh, see later on that uh, there's actually almost a predominance now of the quadrivalent vaccines. And so in the quadrivalent vaccines, uh, WHO has recommended the inclusion as well of B. Fouquet, uh, which is from the Yamagata line. And sometimes slightly different strains have been chosen um, for cell-based vaccines because of uh, the various growth properties. Again, for your reference, uh, here are all of the vaccines um, uh, against uh, influenza that are available in Canada for this year. And uh, I'm not gonna read them all, but uh, just to uh, demonstrate to you that is a, there is a mix of uh, quadrivalent and trivalent vaccines uh, now available. 
Uh, it's important to note that not all products will be made available in all jurisdictions it's based on the policy of the various provinces and territories. Um, the decision to, to include various influenza vaccines as part of publicly, pro, uh, publicly funded programs depends on those uh, uh, provincial and territorial policies. And in addition to regular influenza vaccines, such as the IIV3s, the trivalents, or the IIV4s, that's the quadrivalents, there are specialized influenza vaccines designed to enhance immunogenicity in specific age groups, such as the high dose vaccine for uh, those over 65 years uh, and older. And um, if you want to read the specific product monographs, they're available on the Health Canada drug product uh, website. Here again, for your um, reference are the recommendations to assist you in choosing the optimal product for each particular age group. Again, I'm not going to read them there for your reference, but just to um, uh, uh, remind you that for children, NASI recommends quadrivalent vaccine over trivalent vaccine, as there is a greater burden of influenza B illness uh, in this age group. Uh, note also that uh, 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 LAIV is not uh, licensed for those under the age of 24 months. For adults age 65 years and older, uh, because of the increased burden associated with uh, H3N2 influenza and good evidence of better efficacy of the high dose trivalent vaccine compared to the standard uh, dose trivalent vaccine, NASI recommends that the high dose vaccine should be uh, offered to that uh, age group. And finally, after a careful review of the available uh, data on vaccine effectiveness uh, from various countries, including Canada, uh, over the last several influenza seasons, uh, NASI has concluded that the current evidence is consistent with uh, uh, LAIVs providing comparable protection against influenza to that afforded by inactivated influenza vaccines. Uh, as well, uh, LAIV has been shown to be a safe vaccine, uh, but um, uh, you may be aware that in past years there's been a, uh, a recommendation for prefer preferential use of this vaccine in children, and that uh, recommendation uh, is no longer uh, in effect. And uh, this chart is uh, also for your reference. It outlines the specific route of administration for each type of influenza vaccine by age. Uh, note that the injectable formulations are all given IM and the LAIV is an intranasal formulation for influenza vaccine. Uh, it also notes that if a child has never received any product um, uh, previously, um, that they will need two doses, four weeks apart, minimum four weeks apart, uh, and if so, um, uh, they, if they have had a previous dose, then a single dose is uh, all that is required for, uh, for the current season. In other words, the, pri the um, uh, priming has to be done only once. So what's new for an influenza vaccine in 2020-21? Well, the first is uh, the um, uh, licensure uh, of a mammalian cell influenza uh, vaccine. Uh, it, in other words, it's not uh, grown on eggs. And NASI has reviewed the evidence uh, on this mammalian cell culture uh, vaccine, which is uh, called a flu cell vax quad, uh, it's a quadrivalent vaccine. The mammalian cell culture technology is an innovative technique for uh, influenza vaccine manufacture that may be a valuable alternative to overcome some of the challenges associated with conventional egg-based influenza vaccine uh, production. And it's the first influenza vaccine authorized in Canada that is not uh, made on eggs. Uh, the vaccine was authorized for use in adults and children nine years of age and older in 2019. And NASI has not previously made any recommendations. So this is a new um, uh, recommendation uh, on this vaccine by NASI. NASI, uh, so the statement is that, uh, the recommendation is that NASI recommends that Prucell Vax Quad may be considered among the quadrivalent influenza vaccines offered to adults and children over the age of nine for their annual influenza vaccination. Uh, flu cell vax quad is considered effective, immunogenic, immunogenetic, immunogenic, and safe in adults and the children of that age. And it has a comparable immunogenicity and safety profile to the egg-based vaccines that are already licensed uh, in Canada. The second thing that's new in uh, uh, the uh, statement for 2020-21 is the use of LAIV in HIV-infected individuals. Live vaccines are generally considered to be contraindicated in persons uh, with immunodeficiencies, as you know, out of concern that a live virus may cause disease in the host, it may overwhelm the host. Um, 
and the inclusion of HIV as an option for some HIV infected children may improve the uptake and, and acceptability since this is an intranasal vaccine it does not have to be given uh, by IM uh, uh, route of uh, administration. NASI has reviewed the evidence on the use of LAIV in uh, all HIV infected individuals and has uh, developed a new recommendation uh, based on that uh, information. So the uh, recommendations are that LAIV may be considered as an option for annual vaccination of children aged two to 17 years of age with stable HIV infection who are on highly active antiretroviral therapy and with adequate immune function. And the criteria are listed in the next section there uh, uh, um, involving uh, the um, uh, receipt of heart, uh, the CD4 cell count, and the HIV plasma RNA copies and so on. The IM influenza vaccination is still considered to be the standard for children living with HIV, but if IM uh, vaccination is not acceptable, then H LAIV can be used for these children uh, using the uh, criteria outlined uh, in this uh, previous slide there. Uh, LAIV remains contraindicated in adults with HIV because there's insufficient evidence to uh, make a uh, um, uh, for that uh, uh, The next thing is the uh, use of uh, influenza vaccine in uh, the context of no the novel coronavirus. And this has to do with reserve, uh, reduced observation uh, period of post-vaccination um, for uh, influenza vaccine. In other words, if there are large clinics and there are a lot of people who are congregating to be immunized, could this be a venue for the transmission and propagation of novel coronavirus and those people who are uh, presenting for their um, uh, influenza vaccine. So uh, we're looking at a number of recommend other recommendations uh, in terms of administrative controls and so on, but uh, this is one additional uh, measure that may be uh, possible uh, to uh, decrease the amount of crowding that uh, um, uh, may uh, occur in influenza uh, clinics. Reducing the observation time uh, below 15 minutes uh, could provide um, an additional option and um, that would help to decrease the interactions among the vaccine recipients and also the uh, uh, clinic staff. So we have reviewed the evidence on reducing observation time to see if it is safe to do so. So the evidence shows that many anaphylactic reactions occur between zero to 15 minutes post-vaccination. Uh, some but not all will be captured actually in the first five minutes. Syncope occurred very quickly usually, seizures often later after the 15 minutes. Um, so the, the risk of the transmission of novel coronavirus in a given immunization setting will vary, and therefore it's important that a risk assessment would be done to weigh the risks of not identifying these serious adverse events versus the benefits of having the less interaction of uh, uh, individuals presenting for the influenza vaccine. And one important factor will of course be the level of uh, activity of novel coronavirus in uh, various uh, in, in the uh, various locales. So uh, the uh, recommendation is that a shorter observation period should be considered only if the following conditions are met. And that is that uh, the individual has a uh, uh, past history of having received influenza vaccine. So we know that uh, they have not uh, had a known history of severe allergic reactions to any component of the vaccine and no history of any other immediate post-vaccination uh, reactions, uh, such as uh, uh, syncope or uh, seizures. Um, the statement with the recommendations on the reserve reduced observation period post-vaccination will be available on NASI's website uh, once it has been published. Uh, carrying on with the uh, recommendations, uh, the, the uh, individual should not be uh, operating a motorized vehicle for uh, obvious uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, then also should be accompanied by a parent or other person, a uh, guardian or a responsible adult, who will be acting as a chaperone to monitor what uh, um, happens with the individual. And of course, this has to be uh, with informed consent, so the, uh, both people have to be aware of when and how to seek post-vaccination advice and given instructions on what to do if uh, medical services are required, and then uh, agree to remain uh, in the waiting area um, uh, for the post-vaccination observation period and to notify staff if the recipient uh, looks and feels unwell at any point. 
So who should get the influenza vaccine? Uh, NACI recommends that influenza vaccination should be given to everyone six months of age and older who is not who does, does not have a contraindication to the vaccine. Um, uh, and this will be no surprise to anybody. NACI also recommends uh, influenza vaccination for the following groups, people with chronic health conditions, pregnant women, older adults and young children. There's been no change in this uh, recommendation. Second of all, people capable of transmitting uh, uh, influenza to those at high risk, including household contacts of infants under six months of age and care providers of young children and those at high risk of influenza complications. Uh, people who provide uh, essential community services because we do not want those services to be jeopardized. And then finally, uh, because of the theoretical risk of reassortment of uh, other avian influenzas with uh, circulating strains, uh, that people who are in direct contact with poultry uh, infected with even influenza during culling operations. And Dr. Evans has quite nicely covered all of the groups at high risk. So they're listed there again for um, uh, your uh, reference. Um, it's uh, important to note in this slide, just to remind everybody uh, about the final bullet, uh, children and adolescents undergoing treatment for long periods with acetylsalicylic acid, and this is because of the potential increase of uh, rise syndrome risk associated with influenza. And never forget, of course, that influenza in uh, infection can also lead to the worsening of uh, chronic conditions. Um, in light of uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, people who fall under these two additional groups are also particularly recommended to receive the vaccine. That's anyone who is at high risk for novel coronavirus uh, related illness and anyone who is capable of transmitting influenza to those at high risk of severe or critical illness related to uh, the coronavirus. And although there's a significant overlap in the risk groups for influenza and coronavirus, there are some groups that are not currently listed in the NACI statement for influenza. And an example of that are people living in group homes or communal settings that are identified uh, for uh, coronavirus. And the reasons are, uh, first of all, to decrease the influence of, uh, sorry, the incidence of influenza and the confusion between these two infections, and to protect people who are in double jeopardy for, for both of these uh, infections. So NACI recommends annual immunization for uh, two reasons. One, uh, the potential uh, uh, um, reduction in protection uh, uh, over time uh, from the previous year's influenza vaccine. And of course, because influenza viruses change frequently and uh, the strains need to be uh, monitored, as, as you know. And I've already mentioned uh, the issue of the children um, needing to have two doses if they've never received the priming dose of uh, influenza vaccine. Uh, under contraindications, uh, the most important contraindication is for any person who has had an anaphylactic reaction to a previous dose of influenza vaccine and people have had an anaphylactic reaction to any of the vaccine components with the exception of egg. And that's uh, um, not a new uh, recommendation. That's been looked at for uh, some time now and it's been in place since 2014, when it was shown that the amount of egg protein in the vaccine is not high enough to cause a severe allergic reaction. And um, that observations um, did not identify any reaction that was severe uh, or life-threatening. And there have been many seasons now of post-marketing post uh, safety surveillance in Canada, uh, which has not demonstrated uh, any associated uh, greater proportion of spontaneous reports of anaphylaxis or other allergic reactions uh, because of the uh, egg uh, allergy. Um, as far as uh, um, LAIV is concerned, uh, it is not licensed, as I mentioned before, for children less than 24 months of age and is contraindicated in people with severe asthma or those with medically attended wheezing uh, or, um, in uh, the recent past, pregnant women because it's a live attenuated vaccine and we don't have the safety data at this time, and uh, people with uh, immune, immune compromising conditions because of the, their underlying disease, their therapy, or both. I want to assure people that uh, inf uh, the safety of influenza vaccine is monitored extremely carefully by the uh, Canadian Adverse Events Following Immunization Surveillance System. Uh, some people call it uh, CAPIS. Uh, there's a biannual and quarterly reports on adverse events, which can be found on uh, their webpage. And during the um, pandemic this year, CAPIS and other Canadian surveillance networks are going to be monitoring 
any issues related to the safety of uh, influenza vaccine in the context of uh, coronavirus um, since this is uh, at this point in time that I know. And finally, um, what can you do as healthcare providers? Uh, this, is, this is really important, I think, uh, uh, advice to you all. Um, we know and we've known for years now that the most important uh, factor in the decision about whether a person receives influenza vaccine or not is the recommendation of their healthcare provider. So patients trust your recommendations the most and you are a key driver for uptake and for confidence in uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, and here are some other things that we can uh, uh, have in place. Uh, as healthcare providers, we should receive the vaccine ourselves. Uh, not only to prevent the transmission to patients, but also to demonstrate our uh, confidence in the vaccine. Uh, to use every opportunity to vaccinate people who are at risk, even after we've got influenza activity in our communities, because there still may be some benefit. To discuss the risks and benefit of the vaccine with patients, as well as the risk of not being vaccinated. And finally, to remind people about the other immunization, or sorry, influenza prevention practices. They listed there for you. They will keep people safer not only from influenza, but also from coronavirus. At this point in time, I'm going to um, uh, turn the uh, microphone over to uh, Dr. Harrison, who is going to be presenting on the um, uh, immunization against influenza in the context of uh, coronavirus. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to the East and um, good morning on the West Coast. So I wish to just echo my co-presenters uh, words of thanks to the National Collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases and the Public Health Agency of Canada for bringing us all together virtually today. As we look toward the fall and winter, um, I'd like you all to bundle up and uh, think in layers. So I'm going to be speaking about the COVID-19 overlay that we have this season, and we're going to thicken our layers of prevention. So COVID-19 pandemic has brought a challenge, and so we require additional infection prevention and public health measures to prevent transmission of the novel virus um, amongst our healthcare workers, volunteers in our immunization clinics, and the attendees. We have to look at the suitability and the capacity of our usual venues for this seasonal vaccination. We need to ensure we have sufficient supplies of personal protective equipment, and this may all be particularly relevant this season. And we also have um, a, a new or modified dimension to public fear um, and fear of exposure to uh, disease or the novel virus that may increase demand for influenza vaccination. And so these are things we're keeping in mind. In addition to all of that, we really need a healthy healthcare workforce um, to be able to continue providing the immunizations that we need, seasonal influenza and routine immunizations. So I encourage you to look at this resource from the Public Health Agency of Canada. You'll see the web link on the bottom of the slide. There's guidance this year to help assist in uh, meeting all of these challenges. So the adaptations to our usual processes um, are really going to focus in on um, three main areas that I'm going to try to highlight through the next few slides. Screening for illness or wellness. We want well people coming to our clinics. Physical distancing and infection prevention and control measures, including but not limited to personal protective equipment. So jurisdictions are going to be considering a wide range of strategies this year to deliver the influenza vaccine. And the goal is really going to be to reduce crowding while maintaining or increasing our vaccine uptake. This year means we're gonna have alternative models of vaccine delivery. People are gonna to have to be creative here. And early in the season, you may even be thinking about outdoor clinics. This is, this is going to be a little bit of a different year. Uh, if demand is very high, then potential vaccine supply limitations may affect the way things unfold over the course of the season. So screening for illness applies to everyone, healthcare workers, volunteers, and those attending the clinic. There are many different ways to do this, um, and so you will probably see variability depending where you're working, but options include things like online uh, screening tools, in-person uh, screening upon arrival at a clinic, but ideally just before you enter a place like a waiting room, um, and uh, pre-screening by telephone. Um, the key thing here is, um, this is a reminder for those of you on the line that are healthcare workers or staff working in, in clinics, every day it is our shared responsibility to check ourselves for symptoms and ensure that we are fit and, and ready um, uh, to meet the day safely. 
This also leads into deferral of immunization. So a little different than years past, during the COVID-19 pandemic, individuals with symptoms of acute respiratory infections should defer their influenza immunization until they have recovered. This includes what some have labeled uh, non-severe symptoms, such as a sore throat or a runny nose. This is particularly important this year. The rationale, of course, is that symptomatic people can pose unnecessary risk to others and to the healthcare providers that are trying to maintain this critical service of influenza immunization throughout the season. People who are suspected, probable, or confirmed COVID-19 cases and anyone who's identified as a close contact of a con uh, probable or confirmed case should also defer their influenza vaccination during their period of isolation or quarantine. And for those who wish to simply review uh, what information is presently known about the clinical features of this disease, um, the risk factors, the spectrum of disease, then uh, again, we have a web link here for you. This is COVID-19 signs, symptoms, and severity of disease, a clinician guide. And so I really do uh, encourage you to explore that. The second of our three um, items to really highlight here is physical distancing. So a two meter distance should be maintained from others whenever possible. And so to do this within the context of immunize set, immunization settings, and I know we are diverse uh, ac across the country, consider um, items like this. And I know many have this organized already, but um, it's important to share these ideas and, and these things can be modified uh, depending on the need. We may see novel, um, uh, crowds or groups presenting for immunization this year. So schedule appointments, ask people to arrive at their assigned time and remind them. Consider having people wait in cars or safely physically distancing outdoors, calling them in when ready by telephone or text message. Um, use uh, signage, barriers, floor markings, just as you see our industries uh, doing, um, you know, um, grocery stores and so on are figuring this out and, and we are too in immunization clinics. Space the chairs in the waiting areas two meters apart and allow extra space for those who really need it. Wheelchairs, walkers, strollers, be cognizant of those around us and, and make it easy um, in the settings that we're providing. Monitoring entries and exits, of course, and ensure that this is not forgotten amongst healthcare workers in the break areas or the social moments of our day. Uh, clinic staff distancing from each other is just as important as uh, vaccine recipients in a waiting room. So infection prevention uh, professionals and occupational health professionals will be very familiar with this diagram uh, titled a hierarchy of control. Um, so I just wanna take one quick minute on that picture. Sorry, the mouse is jumping around. There we go. So we can't obviously eliminate COVID-19 uh, COVID yet. So we really focus on the top uh, three here, engineering controls, changing our spaces to make uh, things low risk from an infection perspective Perspective, administration controls, change in the way people work. And I'm going to give you some examples on the next slide. This relates to our policies and our practices. And finally, uh, personal protective equipment, which is, a, as you see, a relatively small piece of this. Think of it as the cherry on top. But the strong foundation, these layers of prevention are, are critical in what we need. So um, the, some examples of these um, engineering administrative uh, controls, the infection control measures we've talked about come when you're well, and that applies to everyone. You'll see already, obviously, clear plastic barriers at reception areas and in clinics, um, physical distancing signs and making it clear, a key, key uh, placement of alcohol-based hand sanitizer to allow hand washing at multiple points throughout a person's experience and ensuring that all of the administration, clinical and patient areas are disinfected, carrying out hand hygiene after and of course before providing immunization and making sure that everyone is well trained, knows what to wear and how to do it. So the final piece that I'm just going to present is um, this personal protective equipment. And there are just uh, a few slides here. So we know that the actual delivery of the vaccine requires that you breach that two meter distance that people are gonna be keeping. And so um, this is where the personal protective uh, equipment becomes relevant as an added layer to having um, attendees well and vaccinators well. So staff, volunteers and vaccine recipients continue, uh, should consider this and you will have local, provincial or territorial guidance on this for the public and for your healthcare workforce and those should be adhered to. 
and uh, promoted. So for the vaccinators, what this means in most jurisdictions is you should be wearing a medical mask. Eye protection um, is also a part of that. Gloves are not needed except when administering intranasal influenza vaccine, and that's due to the increased likelihood of contact with the vaccine recipient's mucous membrane or body fluid. Remember, of course, to change uh, gloves between clients and perform hand hygiene. Some people wonder about aerosol generating uh, procedures. Uh, administering the LAIV is not an aerosol generating medical procedure. For all staff, personal protective equipment should, can be worn for the full duration of a shift, but you have to be aware of when it does need to be changed, if it's soiled, wet, damaged after there's a break, or if ever it turns out that you uh, had interacted with someone who was suspected to have had COVID-19, it would be considered contaminated, should be removed with hand hygiene. So again, remember to uh, review your, your local policies for the most up-to-date on all of these pieces. For other staff in the clinic, for example, clerical staff or volunteers, they should also wear a medical mask whenever they can't maintain a distance. Staff behind a barrier may not need a mask, except if coworkers are also passing by and they're interacting. And this should be kept in mind. Again, really want to emphasize those break room times to avoid transmission amongst staff and keep everyone well. There should be supply within the clinics for um, health emergencies, just as there is every season. Finally, vaccine recipients and their accompanying persons, just depending on your local advice, um, will likely be asked to wear a non-medical mask or face covering. Uh, note that this may be waived for young children for who the mask is problematic and, um, uh, and for those who are having trouble breathing or unable to remove the mask with assistance. And so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Evans. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Dr. Harrison. So uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, go over a review of the AMI Canada guidance on the use of antiviral drugs for seasonal influenza, recognizing that my, uh, the group uh, which I'm part of is in the midst of creating our uh, update to that guidance. Uh, for those of you who may or may not have seen this, this is our uh, 2019 update uh, to the foundation document, which we developed a number of years ago. Um, and um, uh, there's a going to be, I'm going to show you a link to that, or there will be a link to that, sorry, at the end of the presentation that Dr. Gemmel's going to share uh, if you'd like to download the document yourself. So uh, this year we are planning an update. Uh, the working group for, uh, of AMI Canada, uh, of which uh, myself and a number of other AMI Canada members are a part of, uh, are currently uh, uh, developing that guidance. The additions that we have planned for this year uh, are of course the role of Biloxivir, uh, which has now been approved for use in Canada, it goes by the trade name of Zofluza. Um, as well, obviously, as some uh, guidance that may be useful to clinicians in differentiating influenza from COVID-19 illness. Dr. Harrison touched on a link that uh, exists at PHAC, but we really want to explore the, the clinical differences that occur between the two uh, different types of um, respiratory virus infection, as well as the role of laboratory testing, recognizing that right now a considerable amount of laboratory testing is being devoted to COVID-19. And then uh, there will be a, a discussion again about the effects and implications of vaccine composition differences, which do exist between the Southern and enormous, uh, Northern Hemisphere influenza vaccines and what role that may or may not be uh, playing this year. Uh, just a brief word on Biloxivir. Uh, it's a prodrug which undergoes metabolism, releasing the active drug, which is Biloxivir acid. Uh, that's an enzyme inhibitor that uh, targets an influenza virus cap dependent endonuclease in a process uh, referred to as cap snatching, uh, which is a, a function of the virus uh, polymerase complex. It's effective against both influenza A and B. Uh, what's interesting about it is it's administered as a single dose uh, within first uh, 48 hours of illness as it does not require uh, repeat dosing. Uh, however, at the moment, it's only indicated in persons who are age 12 or older. Um, there is some emerging interesting data about Biloxivir. Certainly one of its most impressive impacts so far that we've seen is a reduction in viral shedding, which is more dramatic than is seen with neuraminidase inhibitors. Um, this is actually just from a brief review that was published uh, in uh, August on a comparison of influenza and COVID-19. It's rather wordy uh, and uh, the reference is down at the bottom, which uh, can be shared uh, and really talks a little bit about, you know, uh, roots of transmission and, and some of the dynamics of infectivity. However, one of the things that we uh, are very interested in, in uh, pointing out to people is that 
as a in, in assessing clinically, so there are some features which are very common in, in one virus infection, not in the other. The classic one is anosmia, although it can be described in influenza, it's decidedly uncommon, whereas it appears to be a fairly common presentation for COVID-19. In those with mild illness, if you have done a chest x-ray, it is uncommon, not impossible, but uncommon to see infiltrates. However, in COVID-19, looking at data worldwide, in fact, uh, infiltrates often times are seen even just with mild illness. So that may be an important differentiator. And uh, prominent symptoms at initial presentation are very common with, uh, with influenza. Uh, anybody who's had influenza will usually be able to tell you within about an hour of when it all started. In COVID-19, that presentation can be seen, uh, but oftentimes uh, may be uh, less apparent. And of course, one of the things we know is that moderate to severe disease can be seen and uh, not infrequently with influenza but it's relatively rare uh, presentation in children uh, with, with COVID-19. So just to go over the highlights of our uh, updated uh, um, uh, foundation document from last year, uh, it goes through a number of general principles, talks about the treatment of both mild or uncomplicated influenza illness, as well as uh, what we term moderate, progressive, severe, or complicated. And it's broken down by groups, including non-pregnant adults, infants, children, and youth, immunocompromised persons and pregnant women. And then there's a section that explores the issue of the role of chemoprophylaxis with the neuraminidase inhibitors, uh, including post-exposure prophylaxis versus initiation for oral therapy or early therapy, as well as the, ro the role of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Um, we broke it down according to these uh, great evidence guidances. Uh, with regards to whether it was a strong recommendation, a recommendation, or an option, and then uh, based on a, uh, whether there was a benefit or harm. And, and on the left-hand side here, you can see what the evidence base that was used to uh, provide those recommendations. Uh, so general principles is we feel antivirals, if they're going to be used for influenza, should be initiated as rapidly as possible. Um, However, that interval uh, can be greater than 48 hours and can be initiated if uh, you're seeing a patient who has severe influenza that's enough to require hospitalization, if they have signs and symptoms of progressive, severe, or complicated influenza, or if they're from a high-risk group. And that's been already shown in a couple of slides uh, that I uh, showed, as well as uh, the one Dr. Gemmel showed. Um, in otherwise healthy patients with relatively mild or self-limited influenza, uh, we don't feel antivirals are likely to benefit. Uh, if initiated over 48 hours after the onset of symptoms. Um, uh, patients uh, not initially given antiviral therapy, though, can be advised about symptoms and signs suggesting worsening disease, which would warrant reassessment. Uh, and again, we uh, generally uh, pointed out that for the neuraminidase inhibitors that are currently available, uh, the tr treatment duration should routinely just be five days, and longer than five days is not clinically indicated. Uh, within that uh, foundation document, you'll see this uh, small algorithm here, which basically is related to adults with mild or uncomplicated influenza and whether or not they have risk factors or no risk factors and what should be considered in the way of initiation. Uh, for um, for uh, individuals then with mild or, or uncomplicated influenza, we don't uh, typically recommend um, uh, the use of neuraminidase inhibitors, inhibitors and, uh, with no risk factors. However, if risk factors are present and the illness is less than 48 hours duration, it should be started immediately. And if greater than 48 hours from duration, uh, treatment can still be considered, but it's an option. Uh, now looking at adults with moderate, progressive, severe, complicated illness, uh, we mentioned a number of issues, including whether you, the consideration of hospitalization, ICU care, and whether or not there may be a complicating or a concomitant per, a process such as an acute primary bacterial pneumonia, particularly in adults. <clears throat> in uh, initiating antiviral therapy, uh, if the symptom onset is, is longer than 48 hours, uh, should be really considered for those that aren't responding. Um, uh, to oseltamivir therapy uh, and may be considered to use of uh, zanamivir as whether well others, but it's principally the number one drug uh, that we're currently suggesting use is oseltamivir <clears throat> in most people at a dose of 75 milligrams twice a day for five to 10 days. Um, uh, at the moment, at least, oseltamivir resistance is not broadly described in any of the current seasonal influenza uh, strains that are circulating. Um, <clears throat> the issue around hospitalization and ICU is based on um, evidence that chiefly arose from the 2009 pandemic influenza. So you, you can make an argument that it's not related to seasonal. Um, 
But we certainly recommend that oseltamivir be started even if the interval of symptom onset and the initial administration is greater than 48 hours for those who have moderate, progressive, severe, or complicated influenza illness with or without risk factors. In our um, uh, document, you'll see a, a table that adjusts it for adult patients, recognizing that uh, oseltamivir in particular is renally excreted and may require dosage adjustment, depending on the creatinine clearance, which should be uh, assessed in, in patients uh, generally to make sure that those recommendations are followed. Um, for chil uh, infants, children, and youth, um, we break it down into mild or uncomplicated illness. If there are no risk factors, uh, there's no routine administration required for uh, those age over five. Uh, if it's there between ages one and five um, and there's less than 48 hours, you can consider it, but it's not routinely required. And I point out that uh, at the moment, at least for uh, children under the age of one, antivirals are not approved and should be used on a case-by-case -case basis. If risk factors are present or if the uh, infant, uh, child, or youth has moderate, progressive, severe, or complicated illness. Uh, remember about the issue of hospitalization. Initiating antiviral therapy is appropriate. Um, and uh, again, the use of zanamivir only for those who may have been had prior exposure to oseltamivir. If there's no previous oseltamivir exposure, then that's what they uh, should receive as their antiviral choice. Um, this is just a summary of what I went ran through with you in the algorithm. Uh, a lot of uh, suggestions about uh, being very careful not to routinely use it in children and remembering that under age one, it should be done on a case by case basis. Uh, for more progressive disease, severe, or those with risk factors, hospitalization, start treatment immediately with either oseltamivir or zanamivir, and uh, independent of the uh, fact that the symptoms may have been present for more than 48 hours. For immunocompromised patients in general, and we go over an extensive list of those groups that are considered to be most at risk, you should treat as soon as possible without regard to the duration of illness. And an early initiation of therapy for symptomatic infection in an immunocompromised patient is preferred over uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, in pregnant women, uh, oseltamivir in standard doses is recommended. Uh, for those who are pregnant or up to four weeks postpartum, and that's because we have a wealth of data to suggest that pregnancy at least is a risk factor for more uh, severe or complicated influenza. Um, and uh, I guess this slide needed a little little fixing because uh, there's a couple of typos here. Uh, there are data from the pandemic that demonstrate the safe use of oseltamivir in pregnant women. Uh, so uh, at this point, at least we're, we're not concerned about an, an adverse effect either on the, the woman or the uh, child that she's bearing. Um, when it comes to post-exposure prophylaxis, we prefer early therapy over post-exposure prophylaxis due to the concerns about drug resistance. However, um, post Post-exposure prophylaxis can be considered uh, either in family settings, but more commonly to control outbreaks in closed facilities uh, when it's combined with the administration of uh, influenza vaccine. Um, early treatment or post-exposure prophylaxis should not be prescribed for healthy individuals based on an exposure. Uh, if the close contact did not occur during an infectious period, which for influenza at least is about 24 hours prior to and 24 hours after fever uh, onset. Hang on while I do this. Um, and if more than four days have elapsed. And then finally, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, we recommend that it can be selectively used and considered um, in the following scenarios as a bridge to vaccine-induced immunity during the 14-day period after immunization. Uh, for some high-risk persons for whom vaccine is contraindicated, the protection of patients at high risk in their close contacts when the circulating strains of influenza virus in the community are not well matched to the seasonal vaccine strains. And again, remember, we don't to get that data oftentimes till late in the winter. And occasionally for protection of family members or healthcare workers for whom, again, influenza immunization is contraindicated. That should, that's becoming a smaller and smaller group uh, as we've seen from uh, uh, Dr. Gemmel's presentation. Uh, this is just the algorithm within our paper, which lays out the issues of uh, what to do with uh, close contacts uh, um, uh, of suspected lab-confirmed cases. Uh, if it's a closed facility, there is a recommendation, but you should follow the public health recommendations. Uh, for others, it depends on whether there are risk factors present and whether or not there's immunosuppression uh, to guide the initiation of antivirals in, in general. Um, lastly, uh, I'll just point out this paper, which we published a couple of years ago, uh, which looked at the concern about potential low vaccine effectiveness. 
Um, and, and just a reminder that it can be considered for individuals at high risk for serious influenza complications, regardless of whether they receive the seasonal influenza vaccine, recognizing that in some years we don't get a good match and vaccine effectiveness may be low. Um, uh, it, where influenza is clinically suspected, antiviral treatment of high-risk individuals should be initiated as soon as possible, and ideally within 24 hours, because we get a the more profound effect the earlier that seems to be started. Um, and of course, we are allowing discretion of the local medical officer of health uh, to include staff, uh, et cetera, um, in uh, use of antiviral chemoprophylaxis for the control of influenza outbreaks. So I'm going to stop at that point and turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Gemmel, uh, to finish off with a discussion of key messages and resources for seasonal influenza. Well, thanks uh, I, uh, again, uh, Gerald, for uh, that. And um, this is, to end off today, as Gerald has mentioned, we're going to just provide, be providing you with some uh, of the key messages for patients and some of the resources that uh, you can use to <clears throat> uh, assist uh, you in uh, convincing or uh, helping your patient understand the value of influenza vaccine. Uh, there we go. Um, so these, the key messages, again, for your reference uh, that uh, should be passed along are that everyone six months of age and older is eligible and is recommended to get influenza vaccine, but it's especially important for people who are at high risk of uh, acquiring influenza or developing the complications of influenza and people who are, are capable of spreading influenza to those who are at high risk. We don't have the vaccine for coronavirus yet, but we do have vaccines to protect against influenza. So if we can tell patients that if they're at increased risk for influenza, make sure you to get the annual flu shot. And this year, it's especially important for Canadians to uh, get influenza vaccine, to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with it, and to reduce the further pressure that they may be on the healthcare system during the uh, pandemic. In addition, uh, uh, the message that the influenza vaccine protects against several different strains each season uh, is important, and that's why the yearly vaccine is uh, needed. And even when there is a lower vaccine effectiveness against one strain, the vaccine can, as you saw from Dr. Evans' slides, you can still see uh, uh, protection against the remaining two or three strains, depending upon whether it's a trivalent or quadrivalent vaccine. And of course, there again for you are the general um, uh, recommendations for uh, staying well from all viruses, including uh, influenza. Now, there are also a number of uh, resources that are available for you, and uh, there's a website there for the um, uh, delivery of influenza vaccination in the presence of uh, COVID-19 uh, to support the delivery of influenza vaccination programs. Um, this provides guidance on public health measures uh, that are considered to be uh, uh, needed in the vac uh, vaccination setting to reduce the uh, uh, spread modifications to immunization practices and processing, as you heard from Dr. Harrison, um, alternate vaccine delivery models like outdoor clinics, possibly appropriate use of uh, PPE by staff and volunteers, as you've heard about as well, uh, outreach strategies to administer influenza vaccine to vulnerable persons. And uh, the PHAC in collaboration with NASI has also released the interim guidelines on the continuity of immunization programs during the pandemic. Uh, so it provides uh, details on deferral of immunization and management of the high priority groups. Now, just to uh, go over this very briefly, um, some uh, resources for you include NASI's statement on uh, seasonal influ influenza vaccine for 2020-21, uh, and uh, that I went over in terms of what's new for, uh, with it and so on, but also the uh, um, AMI guide, Canada guidance on the use of antiviral drugs, which you just heard Dr. Evans uh, speak about. Those are, are important uh, references for you and the <clears throat> uh, web links are there. And in addition, the Public Health Agency of Canada provides numerous materials, uh, posters, pamphlets, videos. You can see kind of a, um, uh, a, a, a selection of what uh, may be available that you may find helpful uh, to uh, post in your offices uh, or clinic settings and so on. And there's also um, uh, work that they've done on influenza awareness on social media, including Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and so on. A very important uh, resource for us in Canada is Immunize Canada, which is a national coalition of non-governmental, professional, uh, government and private sector organizations whose 
interest is to promote understanding of uh, the use of vaccines and especially influenza vaccine um, uh, using the recommendations made by NASI. And they have a wealth of uh, uh, materials and uh, information uh, there for you. I strongly advise you to have a look at their website. It's there for you. And uh, finally, it's already been mentioned about uh, flu watch uh, and how um, uh, helpful this is. Uh, I subscribe and I recommend that to you all. I think it's a very good way of keeping uh, tabs on what's going on, not just in your own area, but right across uh, Canada. And with that, I am going to uh, turn uh, the uh, um, floor back over to our, um, our host, uh, Alexandra, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to our speakers for an informative presentation. Before we begin with our Q&A session, I would like to uh, remind everyone that we will be using the Q&A uh, tab located on your screen uh, below in the Zoom, where you can post your questions to our speakers at any time during this Q&A. For those of you who are watching uh, via a live stream, you can email your questions to nccid at umanitova.ca. I would like to also let you know that you can push, um, like the questions to push them up in priority and they will be asked in uh, priority order. So before we begin, um, the first question, which a lot of attendees would like to know the answer to, uh, I would like to start off with a question uh, that um, has um, been on minds of uh, many in the medical community. Um, regarding the, can the flu shot protect a person from COVID-19? And I would like to open this up to all panelists. If you can just maybe briefly let us know your thoughts on the flu vaccine, whether how protective it will be against COVID this year. Well, I can start if you like, Alexander, just by saying that uh, these are different viruses and therefore there's no expectation that the uh, influenza vaccine will provide any protection directly against coronavirus. Uh, it will uh, perhaps provide some, uh, uh, what's the right word here, uh, and some advantage in that if we're not sick with influenza virus and have those all those immunosuppressive kind of uh, phenomena happening, maybe we will not uh, be as sick if we have coronavirus. That's not been demonstrated or shown. Uh, it's just really a theoretical thought. But uh, no, there's no uh, protection that, uh, uh, any patient can get uh, from our, um, the influenza vaccine against uh, uh, directly against coronavirus. I don't know if my colleagues have anything to add to that, but uh, Gerald does. Oh, no, <laughs> Gerald thinks it's complete. Thank you. No, I, I think you've covered it, uh, Ian. I, I guess I'll only add that I think it's particularly important this season that we really focus on 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 what we know because there's always a bit of trepidation with a new pathogen and, and what evidence we have. And so we do know influenza vaccine protects against influenza and strains on the healthcare system. And so uh, we have that, but but there's nothing to suggest, as Ian said, that and, and no reason to think that this would protect against another virus. And this, this pandemic, unlike the others this century, is not a influenza pandemic. It's, it's, it's a different virus. It's a coronavirus. So it's important to remember. It makes it quite unique that way. Dr. Evans, do you have anything else to add to this question? No, my thumbs up was all that, uh, that Dr. Gemmel said. It, yeah, a different virus, folks, not going to protect you against COVID-19, but uh, some benefits because it's going to protect you against influenza. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as we heard, Australia had a very mild flu season this year. Could you speak to any da data that is out there as to why that may have been? And also to what extent can we really rely on what kind of influenza season we had in the Southern Hemisphere and how can, uh, how can this be applicable to Canada? Again, I would like to hear all of the panelists on this, please. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start off and, and uh, I'm going to see if this works because I would, uh, oh, I guess I'm looking at your screen. I was going to show some, I was going to show everybody a graph which, uh, which has popped up, which shows that really across all of the Southern Hemisphere countries, the, the graphic that I showed you from Australia also holds in there. But uh, I don't know if NCCID wants to relinquish their screen so I can put this up because I can't, I don't know if I can share it with them there. No. Oh, I will. I'm going to stop your screen sharing. So NCCID, you're going to have to put your slide up afterwards. 
Uh, here's what I want to show everybody. Um, so this, uh, I think what you're seeing here is this is data uh, from WHO showing a number of Southern Hemisphere countries, Argentina, Australia, Chile, New Zealand, Paraguay, and South Africa. And you can see the dramatic reduction in influenza activity uh, in the Southern Hemisphere in general. I, I did show you the picture of the Australian data. Um, and this is all up to now the beginning of September. So. Um, in general, uh, what it's what it's telling us is that you know there is a there's a very general effect. I I I'm always a little worried about predicting influenza seasons in the northern hemisphere, but this really does suggest that that there is a significant reduction. And I would, even though I I put some provisos in my slide that there were different vaccine composition and we don't know about viral interference and we we also know that there was big vaccine uptake. I think the reduction we're going to see in the Northern Hemisphere and in influenza activity is directly related to public health measures, to the social distancing that we're doing with masks and all this other stuff. Um, and I think uh, I would predict, dare I do it, uh, that we will probably have a relatively mild influenza season this year with a, a drop off, I think, in the frequency of infections. Um, one person did ask in the Q&A, uh, which I answered a little bit, was, um, what's, uh, you know, what is going to happen with a COVID-19 influenza co-infection? Um, that's really, really speculative at this point. We know that there is a thing called viral interference that occurs with respiratory viruses, that infection with one can sometimes prevent infection with the other. And we really don't have a handle yet, um, and I've not seen any data, I don't know if uh, either uh, Dr. Gemmel or Dr. Harrison have, on reported cases of COVID-19 influenza co-infection and whether that would be a terribly bad infection or whether it even occurs. And number-wise, um, I've not seen any reports out of the Southern Hemisphere countries of co-infections, but that's going to be hard to spot because influenza activity is so low that even if those co-infections are occurring, they're probably occurring in very, very small numbers. I think that was what the question was. Now I'm thinking that I've got the wrong question. I can just add, Alexandra, that um, I, Gerald said uh, very nicely uh, um, the, the answer to this question. And uh, just to reinforce that uh, pro we're all assuming it was the public health measures that we all are now observing that are uh, had the effect in uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere. And we hope that that will be the case uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. But uh, a, a consequent question might be then why get the influenza vaccine? And I think that um, the answer to that question is that influenza is extremely unpredictable. Uh, we know a few things about it, but largely when it comes um, uh, and how it affects us, uh, which one it is, uh, is, is, is always a, a question mark each year. And so I think that uh, the answer to patients is if, if, if uh, we expect that there may be a lower incidence of, uh, of uh, uh, influenza this, this year, why get the vaccine? I think the answer is that we just, uh, we can hope for that, but that's not a guarantee. And so I think influenza vaccine will continue to give people uh, additional protection. And if it was the public health measures, my gosh, we should have been doing this for a long time, eh? So <laughs> we would have had much less influenza around if we'd been washing our hands and perhaps being a bit, a bit more careful in social situations over the years. Thanks. Well, Alexandra, since you've asked all three of us, I'll just add my two cents, but I think uh, th these are excellent answers. You have what you need. But I, I guess I'll maybe just try to add the one angle that anything we can do this season to keep our lives straightforward and our public messaging clear will help us. And so yet another reason to obtain influenza vaccine is, um, as many, many people on this call will know, our public health teams, our infection prevention teams are working full speed and keeping influenza out of this equation um, helps us in, in many ways. It isn't just the um, acute care strains, uh, it's also uh, being able to keep messages uh, simple and straightforward and if people all want to do the right thing and staying home and sick physical distancing um, those things help but but we don't we know there will still be some infections we can see that already from COVID-19 so let's use our vaccine and every kit in the toolbox to prevent influenza this season more so than than any other really. Thank you very much my second point to that question was exactly what you elaborated on as to a lot of uh, people might question, why should we be pushing the influenza vaccine if the season might be uh, milder this year? Uh, so thank you for those answers. Um, so I would like to move on to the question uh, that you all see on top of your screen uh, regarding the long-term care um, facilities. And the question comes from Jean. Um, she is looking for guidance 
on uh, when residents in long-term care receive flu vaccine, sometimes they experience side effects that mimic symptoms similar to COVID-19. How do we manage this without overswabbing residents for COVID-19? I'll open it up for uh, Dr. Gemmel, please. Well, I guess I'll just start to say that uh, this is a tough question. And I think it's a question that, that, that has a lot of nuances to it. And I think the answer involves a lot of judgment about what else is going on in the community. So for example, if, it's a, if, we, if you're uh, in a uh, hot spot for uh, coronavirus uh, uh, in Canada, then you might be thinking uh, more likely that you should be testing a few people if they're getting this kind of uh, reaction post uh, uh, um, influenza and stop them if uh, all the tests come back negative. Uh, if you haven't got much then in, uh, um, uh, coronavirus in, in uh, the community, maybe uh, your approach is going to be slightly uh, different or, or none, uh, for example. So I, I think that this really is a question of, of judgment. And I think that it's a question of perhaps testing the waters. And uh, if you find that, and so you're not over swabbing, I agree that that would be unpleasant as well. Um, but that you may want to do a, a wee bit of testing to uh, ascertain what you're dealing with. Um, and understanding, of course, that uh, if this is happening in the context of people just having received influenza vaccine, that this could be the more like, most likely cause. So I don't know if my uh, colleagues have anything to add to this, but it's, um, uh, it, it, it is a very nuanced and uh, a tough question. And I think uh, one that um, uh, we're all going to have to kind of uh, uh, think carefully about based on individual uh, and local uh, situations. That, that's really true. So, so thanks for that. And I, I, I agree with you. I also want to point out, though, that long term care settings are one of our most challenging uh, settings to differentiate sy symptoms. And we have atypical presentation of disease in the elderly. And we also want to keep it really clear what, what our vaccine side effects are, you know, all the time as part of our monitoring. So, so I think in a case where you have symptoms, then just as uh, Dr. Gemmel is highlighting, it, it, um, it would be prudent to, to you, you can feel justified in, in testing around that event. Um, and, and I think the challenge, and we saw this um, through Dr. Evans' slides, the challenge with this pathogen is that unlike influenza, which is abrupt in onset, people can often pin it down to the minute when you interview them. Um, this particular virus is variable person to person and the onset can be subtle. And so this, this is what you've articulated here. This is the challenge that clinicians and practitioners are facing. And so keeping COVID-19 in mind um, is, is important and the test will help you uh, steer one way or the other. Thank you. Second question that um, is on top of our screen is would full PPE would be required if administering vaccines at home? I think Dr. Harrison could speak to that, please. Um, okay, sure. So, so thanks for that question. Uh, good question. I'm imagining, and I hope I'm catching this correctly, but that this might refer to those who are administering vaccines through home care, which, which would be terrific um, because uh, this is the year we need all hands on deck. But uh, so in that context, what I would say is that I think we have to uh, have it mirror what we're doing in any clinic setting. So, so whatever you're setting, these layers of prevention, which includes planning ahead, interviewing ahead, calling ahead, asking about symptoms, doing a point of care risk assessment. That's part of our, uh, you know, national infection prevention guidelines, and I know uh, jurisdictions across the country. So, stop at every moment, not just the first time you ever meet someone to to. Uh, consider those symptoms that could be COVID-19. If you think someone has symptoms, then your actions are going to be quite different. You're going to defer immunization. You would want personal protective equipment to provide care. But to simply provide immunization, um, ensure physical distancing in the home. If there's many people living in the home, you want others who are ill away, uh, not with you in that shared space. But, uh, but you could safely proceed using standard precautions. And in most jurisdictions, and I'm careful here because I know every province has some variability, but continuous masking, for example, part of your uh, provincial standard recommendations to safely deliver care to someone who's asymptomatic, because you're going to screen ahead, and then you wouldn't need uh, full so-called uh, PPE. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, do Dr. Emil, Gemmel or Dr. Evans, did you want to add maybe anything to this question? I have nothing relevant to add, no, thanks. Uh, John Harrison covered it all extremely well. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I 
I would like to ask um, Dr. Harrison to elaborate on the safety of the new reduced post observation period recommendations. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so um, the um, hard, hard to give a short answer to some of these. We're preparing a whole statement on this, so you'll be able to read uh, more about this. But uh, essentially, all of those criteria um, that Dr. Gemmel articulated are with safety in mind. Um, so, you know, we know that anaphylactic reactions can occur. We also know they're extremely rare. And in providing this guidance, um, the types of things that were review, reviewed was the literature. Uh, so a rapid review was done of the literature. Um, also surveillance data, including our own, um, the CAFIS, uh, Canadian surveillance data that Dr. Gemmel had referred to over several seasons. And so um, as his slides outlined, you know, not all anaphylactic reactions are even captured within 15 minutes. And, and so then, you know, proportion are captured in five minutes. So what, what this uh, change here would do is change the focus from uh, any idea that you might actually capture everything in 15 minutes, which, which isn't the case, to really focusing on giving people instruction of how to be safely monitoring with, say, a chaperone in those minutes and hours after immunization. So, so um, the the safety it says it's almost an added layer of safety in that you're giving people some direction, things to watch for. We that's always done, I know, in immunization clinics. But there are several parameters built in there that you're going to be with someone else, that you have an understanding of how you might seek help when you need it. And, um, and and if you look at those um, itemized, that long itemized list, um, I think you'll you'll see that it uh, definitely has safety in mind and, and would and would protect. And so it helps people basically to be prepared. Um, but but these are extremely rare uh, reactions and and the the things that are outlined there ensures that no one is sort of um, le left all alone. Well, thank you to, add to, to what uh, Dr. Harrison has said, Alexandra. Uh, just so people are aware, I think I said it, but I'll just uh, uh, reemphasize it. And that is that uh, Massey looked at this uh, as an option for um, places where, for example, if there's a lot of coronavirus activity in that community uh, during the period of time in which influenza vaccine is uh, clinics are planned and so on, um, if we if we if um, the uh, immunizers uh, uh, feel that there's any reason to think that um, there would be additional risk. Uh, at immunization clinics, we do not want people to get coronavirus because they went to get their influenza vaccine. If it looks like it's a, a, a community where there's not much uh, uh, coronavirus uh, around and um, distancing measures are in place because um, perhaps the uh, population seeking influenza vaccine is not that high, it uh, need necessarily be, be, uh, be uh, implemented. So it's there for people if you need it and, uh, and uh, the research has been done so that you um, will understand what this, it's all about risk management here. Um, so it uh, is there as an option for planners for immunization clinics. It's not being recommended as a standard practice. Yeah, so th thanks for that. And actually, that, so that's a critical uh, point. So so thank you for that. And it's also meant to be there as an option for clinics that are, that are finding they need to uh, pivot, so to speak, uh, due to unprecedented crowding. So uh, this, this comes in part from um, work done in other countries, but also uh, based on our own reflections and the data that came from the 2009 pandemic, when you have, uh, so an immunization clinic could look at all of these other layers of prevention we've talked about, but if you're finding you suddenly have a waiting room that is uh, in a high prevalence area, it's unsafe uh, seeming because of the crowd, then that's that was the intent of this added option, um, but uh, not, not, not a standalone for all comers. Thank you, I apologize as my internet connection was unstable. I briefly lost my video and I hope you can hear me well. Yes. And Okay, great. Um, so I will, I'm, I'm sorry, but because I was dealing with some technical difficulties here, I wasn't sure if you uh, got to the answer uh, that was uh, posted by our next uh, uh, attendee. Uh, you talked about minimizing waiting time after flu shot was given. How long will you recommend for somebody with no allergies and no history of adverse reaction, uh, I guess, to wait would be another question. I'm sorry, I apologize if you may have already mentioned this in your answers, but uh, if you did, we can just move on. Um, I, I don't think we did, so uh, it was, it's five minutes. 
as opposed to the 15 minutes. And it's in, and then it, it is meant to be in the context of the list of other parameters. So five. Because all those other criteria need to be met, uh, just to repeat them quickly, uh, have received influence of the vaccine in the past, so there's no surprises in terms of uh, potential uh, uh, um, anaphylaxis in the first event. No known history of severe ana uh, allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine. No history of other immediate post-vaccination reactions, such as syncope. syncope. Um, uh, will not be operating a motorized vehicle just because if it happens at minute 10 after you've left, and you're on the road, that's not a good thing. Uh, and then it's accompanied by a, a, a responsible adult who will be a chaperone for that uh, period of time. So those are the uh, additional criteria. And they're in the slides for anybody who needs to refer to them. Okay, thank you so much. We'll move on. Um, the, the next question is, what is NACI's recommendations on providing immunization while the patient is in a vehicle? Any concerns around shoulder injuries or risk of anaphylaxis occurring while in a vehicle? Well, I guess I'll start with this one to say that the uh, I know that this, uh, there have been uh, immunization clinics held in uh, vehicles, uh, even in previous years in other parts of uh, uh, the world. And uh, I personally, I have not been involved in, uh, in any of these. And uh, nor has NASI specifically uh, looked at uh, the evidence on the issue of trying to immunize somebody through a car window. I think the best thing I can say at this time is that all of the usual uh, administration precautions and all the usual administration procedures should be in place. And that um, uh, uh, it's not, it's, this is a, a way I think of separating people. It's not a way of cutting corners in terms of uh, the actual uh, administration of the vaccine. Uh, so if uh, people are planning to do this, uh, there's no specific uh, guidance that NASI has provided so far. But I think I would say that uh, uh, it's really very important to make sure that um, you are set up so that you can um, provide vaccine in a very similar way, similar heights and so on, so that you're not um, creating a problem uh, for uh, the uh, vaccine recipient that wouldn't have occurred in a, in a, in a usual vaccine setting. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. The next question I think is on the minds of a lot of parents and clinicians as well. And it is, how should clinicians and parents handle the expected mild symptoms associated with flu vaccination, example, mild fever, and the school requirements that children stay away from school for 14 days if they have symptoms regardless of COVID testing? I would like to open this up to all of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start off with this. When I looked at the question first, I thought it was, what are you gonna do about you know, mild symptoms, uh, which we're getting from respiratory viruses in general, but I see now it was related to flu vaccine. Um, so, you know, it goes to actually a number of other questions further down in the Q&A, which is what are we going to do in terms of, uh, you know, addressing whether or not this is influenza or COVID-19. Um, the One of the challenges we've had with COVID-19 is recommendations are kind of all over the map depending on the province and even within a province what region you're in as to whether, you know, a student would have to be off for 14 days, whether they should be COVID-19 tested, which as everyone knows is now driving up huge numbers uh, for requests for COVID testing because we, uh, other than some provinces like Alberta, which has really suggested to curtail asymptomatic testing of low risk uh, individuals, um, it's creating a big problem. But essentially, uh, you know, there is a lot of clinical judgment that's going to have to be put into place. Um, and uh, certainly I am very sympathetic to our primary care physicians who are oftentimes being asked to provide a letter saying that this student doesn't need testing or this student can go back. Uh, because once those plan, um, sort of recommendations or directives are put into place, it be becomes very difficult. And, and the only thing I would say is that, uh, you know, although you can see some reactions to vaccines, which I'll let Dr. Harrison, Dr. Gemmel talk about a bit more, um, it's not a super common thing. I, I, I still keep getting this idea that people think that half of the people who get a flu shot get a fever and it just doesn't happen. And I've answered a few questions with, which is very relevant, which is what do I do with people who said they got the flu shot and they got the flu and it happened more than once? And the answer is, is that there's a lot of respiratory viruses that circulate starting in the fall. And the likelihood and coincidence that you got your flu shot, you were incubating a rhinovirus, an adenovirus, uh, some other kind of, uh, of uh, you know, human coronavirus in there is actually very, very high. So we just have to remind people that, um, you know, there are more viruses than just flu that cause uh, what 
the general public perceives to be a flu-like illness. Um, I mean, real flu is a pretty devastating illness when you compare it to something you get from a rhinovirus or a respiratory adenovirus. And until you suffer those, you really don't quite get an understanding for them. But there's a lot of education that needs to be done in general public. And I think, and I'm hoping that, you know, people who are listening in today on this will really understand that we are talking about a hodgepodge of different viruses. This year, it's been really complicated by COVID-19. And some of the questions were, well, you know, should I give somebody a flu antiviral if I think they have the flu, but I'm still waiting for testing to come back? And that's going to depend a lot on if you look at our guidance from AMI Canada, you know, what is it? Are they at risk? Is this a more mod is this a more severe form of illness or, or is this someone more likely to get complications? If that's the case, then administering an, an influenza antiviral may be very appropriate while you're waiting for testing to come back if you can order it. Um, and can get it because somebody else was asking about what about testing? So lots of places are probably going to be doing multiplex testing. In other words, if you ask for an influenza test, you'll get an influenza and a COVID test. Or if you ask for a COVID test, you'll get both. Um, but it's not universal. Even within provinces, I just came off a call last week with my, our working group at AMI Canada, and we found out that some provinces are going to offer multiplex testing in some parts of the province, but not in other parts of the province. So I guess my my final remark before turning it over to Dr. Harris and Dr. Gemmel for some comments is, yeah, folks, this is going to be really complex this year, uh, and, and we don't have any easy, readily usable answers. We do have to rely a lot on clinical judgment. And I would certainly suggest that you consider reaching out to your infectious disease colleagues for advice if you are concerned. Um, usually we're reachable. There's not enough of us. Anybody who wants to go in ID, give me a call. Uh, we really do need more infectious disease doctors. But it is going to be a very difficult year this year. And I think the silver lining as I see it is kind of what I talked about with the Southern Hemisphere. If, if we have it, and I think we are going to have a very low influenza season, then in fact, most of the more significant respiratory infections you're likely to see this year uh, in through the fall and winter are going to be COVID-19. So at that point, I will stop my long-winded diatribe. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Dr. Harrison or Dr. Gamble, would you like to add anything to uh, this question? The first thing I just have to say is that it's not a reason not to give the influenza vaccine. Uh, as Gerald has said, uh, it's <clears throat> uh, not that common that we have uh, a fevers that are going to make us uh, think some of this coronavirus. But it is uh, a greater issue, as uh, Dr. Evans has said. Uh, as recently as uh, this morning, I, I had a meeting with somebody who told me that her daughter had been sent home with fever, and, uh, not fever, a headache and fatigue, and, it would, and wouldn't be readmitted to school until she had coronavirus testing. It's going to be um, a, an issue, not just about influenza vaccine, but about many, many things uh, this, uh, this winter. It's going to be a, a tough winter. As uh, Dr. Evans has said, I don't think that there are really uh, any easy answers. Perhaps the best thing uh, that we can say is, or remember is that if there are uh, side effects from influenza vaccine, they're going to be linked in time. Uh, if it's fever, it's going to be within the first couple of days and that uh, perhaps observation and treatment, and if it resolves uh, very well, then I think that we can probably give people the advice that uh, uh, if it's resolved, that uh, coronavirus testing um, uh, isn't necessary as a, uh, uh, based on the fact that we have a temporal relationship to uh, influenza vaccine. But um, having said that, um, I can see that um, uh, others out there might be saying it's going to be a requirement and um, uh, we'll just see, have to see how that all works out. Um, it's going to be a difficult winter, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Harrison, would you like to add anything? If not, I can just move on to the next question. Just wanted to give you a chance. Thank you for that. I think that they've covered it really well. I guess the only thing, this will sound obvious, and probably no one wants to really hear this, but we all have to be patient this year because these are our challenges and we're going to have to roll with it. And that will mean days off here and there um, and extra consults and, and that's okay. That's what we'll do. All right. Thank you. I think the next question uh, is directly um, at um, Dr. Gemmel. I think it, um, if I read it correctly, it's uh, asking why is the high dose flu vaccine not recommended for people below 65 years of age who are not, uh, who are, who might be at risk. So given that the COVID complications uh, this flu season, would you not recommend the high dose to all clients of all ages, Dr. Gemmel? Well, I've actually asked the same question. When they did the, um, uh, the clinical trials on the high-dose vaccine, why didn't we do it for everybody? 
uh, if four doses, uh, sorry, four times the dose, and otherwise 60 micrograms instead of 15 micrograms of each component uh, protects uh, older people better. Why not uh, uh, do this for younger people? And I, going on a bit of a limb here, because I, I, I think this is correct, but please don't quote me on it, that, uh, that uh, the uh, manufacturer may be looking at this. But so far, uh, th there's been no um, licensure for this vaccine uh, in people uh, uh, who are not over the age of 65. And this is one of the issues is um, who should um, uh, get a vaccine off license. Well, that's uh, for uh, the purposes of uh, government programs. It's, it's going to be rare to see a government program uh, in which uh, they will take accept the liability of using the vaccine uh, off license, that is, uh, outside the age group in which uh, it's recommended, uh, even though the risk may be tiny, even though we may have no reason to think that there's going to be uh, any uh, uh, problem whatsoever. So this is going to be, if that happens, there's going to be a decision of the purchasers of the vaccine, which is the provinces or territories, uh, but I am not aware of any that have gone down this road, um, uh, even though I think uh, there may be many uh, people out there who think that uh, this might uh, be a good idea at this time. Uh, the other issue, of course, with this vaccine is the cost and uh, provinces and territories, even if it were, were licensed for people uh, under the age of 65, that um, the uh, cost uh, may be um, an issue that would make uh, provinces and territories think twice about uh, putting it in their, their list, even if it were licensed. So it's really about uh, um, uh, the licensure. It's about the uh, data for clinical trials. And I think on a, 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 a program-based basis in which uh, many, many people are receiving the uh, influenza vaccine. I don't think there will be an appetite for uh, the um, uh, program organizers and managers and funders uh, to go down the road of using a uh, vaccine unless it's authorized for use in that age. Hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. What is your recommendation for providing influenza vaccine for persons who have been exposed to COVID and are asymptomatic and are self-isolating. Dr. Gemmel? Well, I guess I'd start by saying if someone's self-isolating, I like them to stay in isolation. <laughs> and if they are been exposed to uh, coronavirus, they should stay there until uh, they pass the 14-day uh, um, uh, maximum incubation period. I think after that, if they have not become ill and have not tested positive coronavirus, there's no reason why they shouldn't um, immediately uh, get the um, vaccine because after this period of quarantine, um, they can go about their business. Uh, if they do develop coronavirus, uh, I don't think any of us know uh, yet what happens if influenza is, uh, vaccine is given to somebody with coronavirus. Maybe my colleagues uh, can answer this better than I. Um, uh, but uh, 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 I would uh, think it would be uh, reasonable to wait until uh, the uh, illness had resolved before um, uh, proceeding with other immunizations such as influenza. Um, so we don't want somebody with uh, uh, who's in quarantine to be going out and we don't want somebody who's ill with coronavirus to be going out. We want them to stay home. I think it's as simple as that. Thank you very much. We'll yeah, move I, on to the next question. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was just gonna add a little something in around COVID-19. So in people with mild to moderate COVID-19, they pretty well clear all virus uh, at about uh, around between day eight and day 10. And, um, you know, most of the issues around uh, immunogenicity of vaccines relates to febrile illnesses. So if they've recovered from their COVID-19 and in a mild to moderate case, which would be somebody who was at home and never had to go into hospital, um, you know, I think the opportunity to do influenza immunization exists after day 10, uh, presuming that they are now, um, you know, either minimally or completely asymptomatic um, after having had a confirmed test and from the day of onset of symptoms. So I think that's entirely useful. But with all the caveats that Dr. Gemmel put into place about certainly not wanting them to go out to get their flu shot if it could be administered to them uh, at home as necessary. Great, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next question. Please clarify what PPE a healthcare worker should wear when immunizing a client for flu vaccine to prevent transmission of COVID-19, keeping in mind COVID-19 is droplet and contact transmission. Uh, okay, thanks. I can respond to this one. Um, so, so again, think in layers and remember that hierarchy of control. So, so actually our immunization clinics are, are highly, um, they're, they're controlled environments. So you've pre-screened the individuals that are coming. So people should be coming well. 
So you shouldn't need gloves, gowns, mask, and eye protection. There will, uh, sorry, all of, you shouldn't need all of that. Uh, but um, as, as we were saying earlier, each province is gonna have recommendations around mask and or eye protection. So one thing to remember with the person actually administering vaccine is that you are uh, getting in close. You can't keep that two meter distance barrier the whole time, otherwise you can't administer a vaccine. So continuous masking, um, both of the, per the recipient and the healthcare worker, or even just the healthcare worker is uh, probably our, our biggest added uh, prevention measure. And it, th those masks help to remember, contain the secretions of the person wearing the mask uh, as well. So, so essentially continuous masking, I think you'll find across the country is recommended. And, and yes, some um, also including uh, national guidance will mention eye protection for that time when you're in close. Um, but um, but you wouldn't need, for example, gloves, gown, mask, and eye protection, and unless for some reason you realize the person had symptoms. But in that case, you're actually going to be deferring the immunization. Great, thank you. You um, bundled up and think and layers comment that just got a few likes. So uh, <laughs> people like uh, like the idea that you put on your slides, Dr. Harrison. Um, a question that uh, came up, could you elaborate on the status of research and development on the COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine? Are you able to speak to that, uh, Dr. Gamal, or all panelists? I see Dr. Evans has his hand up, so why don't you start, Gerald, and I'll follow up. Perfect. Yeah, there's a, there are a lot of candidate vaccines at varying levels, uh, phase one, two, and three trials. Um, and uh, right now, uh, there are at least four or five that are in phase three. Um, at least a couple of them are using an antivirus vector, two are using an mRNA type um, uh, technology. Uh, and I think the real recognition is that these are new <coughs> technologies for us to use in human vaccines. <coughs> they don't follow the sort of traditional vaccines that we've all developed. Um, uh, timelines are very guessable. Um, as a person who follows this unbelievably closely, I will tell you that I don't see uh, a approval in a country which has a more rigorous process than perhaps some countries that have declared a vaccine now regula regula regulatorily approved. Uh, I don't think we're looking at anything until the very early part of 2021. And then manufacturing stuff and everything else, we're not gonna have vaccine out until uh, middle of 2021 if you're an optimist and probably a little bit later. And at that time, we may or not may or may not have one to two or even three can, uh, vaccines that are out there that, that can be used. Uh, lots of logistics are going into all this. A little off topic, but there we go. Ian? I just to add to that, uh, I, I think uh, Joe's made a very good point that if we want uh, to um, do the right thing with regard to immunizing against coronavirus, the vaccine has to have those two qualities. We talk about every vaccine safety in the first instance, and second of all, being effective. And if either one of those fails, there's going to be a huge lack of confidence, especially in the former. Uh, safety is a critically important uh, factor uh, in public confidence in the vaccines. And I think the worst thing that we could do is race into a vaccine that has been untested or has been too little tested, uh, not uh, discover a common uh, serious side effect that could be put, put people at risk. Having said that, I think that in Canada, we're lucky because uh, our, um, our uh, leaders uh, in public health and nationally uh, have um, looked at uh, a, a number of options and uh, have actually put out options on vaccines. So we don't have just one uh, potential option. Uh, there are several, as I understand, in terms of um, the uh, uh, news reports of, of government having made um, uh, contracts with various uh, potential man uh, vaccine manufacturers and researchers. And uh, I don't know much about it, but I'm just going to mention that, uh, as an example, um, Dr. Evans has mentioned there's been many different technologies, some of them previously untried, and that's, I think, part of the safety issue. But I was intrigued to hear that uh, out of Quebec, there's a vaccine that mimics the HPV vaccine. In other words, provides a virus with no genetic material, but only the protein coat. And we know how well HPV vaccine works in terms of its effectiveness. It was highly effective. So all I can say is let's keep our fingers crossed that one of these uh, options works out for us and uh, that we've got some uh, good options for it, um, uh, potentially in this country. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Harrison, did you want to add anything or I can move on to the next question? Good to move on. That's excellent answers. We're going to have to be patient and, and do it once and get it right, or, or do it several times and get it right. We have, as we've heard, lots of candidates. So this is going to be unique, but uh, everyone wants to have it go safely and, and know that we've got something that's going to work. 
Okay, great. A question about the live attenuated influenza vaccine that was not available um, in great uh, supply last year. Um, somebody is uh, asking if there is an expected, expected supply issue this year. Uh, Dr. Gelman, would you like to speak to that? Uh, I guess the best I can answer is I'm not uh, um, uh, sure about how much vaccine or what each province has or ordered. Uh, last year it was not available and that was a, a um, decision made by the manufacturer AstraZeneca. Uh, I am not aware of the rationale behind it, uh, but that's a, uh, a corporate decision that they made not to make it uh, available in Canada. It was available in other countries last year. I understand that it is um, going to be available from the manufacturer, and I understand that some provinces will uh, have um, uh, purchased it for use this year, but I don't have it at my fingertips which one. I don't know if my colleagues do, but uh, that's the best I can answer that question. Okay. Thank you. Moving on, aside from infection control considerations, are there any concerns, contraindications on receiving the influenza vaccine in COVID-19 positive patients? Maybe Dr. Gerald Evans would like to. Sorry, just got on my, my microphone. Sorry, fire that question at me again, Alexandra. <laughs> yeah, aside from infection control uh, considerations, are there any concerns or contraindications on receiving the influenza vaccine in COVID positive patients? Uh, no, I think the main in, the main contraindication we were talking about is if you're uh, acutely ill and you're febrile, uh, we, we usually do not administer vaccines to people uh, during a febrile illness because we know the immunogenicity of the virus is poor. I'll just add on that somebody had thrown out a few questions about prednisone. Um, uh, as uh, if someone's on prednisone, can they get the vaccine? I probably should let uh, Dr. Harrison, and Dr. Gemmel answer this, but the general consensus in the ID world, as long as you're under about 20 milligrams per day of prednisone as a dose, uh, the sort of immunosuppressive effects are actually quite minimal. Um, and uh, I know a lot of vaccine studies oftentimes exclude patients who are on uh, immunosuppressives in terms of measuring the immunogenicity of virus, but uh, maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Harrison and Dr. Gemmel to uh, put in their two cents about uh, it, you know, contraindications if you're on prednisone or anything further to add about COVID-19. Well, I guess just to say that uh, the LAIV, which is um, licensed up to age, oh, I think it's 59, uh, uh, can be given, so can, can be given to uh, children and some adults, but uh, are not in people who are immunocompromised, either because of illness or because of treatments, which include prednisone. So I, I think that would be uh, uh, um, important to recall is that in, in immunosuppression is the reason not to give LAIV. Uh, but other, uh, for the inactivated uh, uh, vaccines, it's just a question of, as Dr. Evans has said, how well the vaccine is able to work and if the immunosuppression is uh, not so uh, uh, deleteriously affected, uh, there is, can still be some benefit. Um, uh, I don't know enough about um, uh, the treatment of people some, uh, with the high, no, high dose uh, um, prednisone therapy to say that uh, they uh, shouldn't be given it uh, because it doesn't work at all. Uh, so I'll leave that uh, to uh, uh, my colleagues to comment on. And I think I think I guess all I'll add is that it um, it's important to immunize those around um, the immunized compromised people. So those at high risk of transmitting, because we, you know we know these may not work as well. So let's get everyone immunized to protect them. Um, I want to go back though, Alexandra, just to the original question um, about apart from infection control, um, is it safe to immunize someone with active COVID nineteen? So I will just point out that one of the challenges that people have been dealing with over the past many months is that having a COVID-19 positive test is one point in time when it's positive um, and the illness is sometimes uh, not at that same time and some people do have a persistently positive test quite some time after illness so I suppose there could be questions about that if your test is positive uh, you know those cases are going to be managed have to be managed case by case to review when the person's illness was uh, in relation to the test so when is it safe from an infection prevention perspective and then that's where those key points that Dr. Evans mentioned about what actually are the symptoms, when were they there, when have they gone away, those will all end up having to be factored in. I'm sure there'll be some situations like that. And, and you, you may just simply require some case-by-case um, -case consultation. Thank you. 
An interesting question came in is if there is viral interference with bacterial infections such as pneumococcal infections be of more concern as well this flu season? Uh, yeah, most of the stuff we know about interferences between viruses, so uh, respiratory viruses have been studied. There was actually a great review that was just published, I think, in 2019 uh, from a group that have studied uh, viral co-infections and, and those impacts. So the question here is, is does a bacteria like Streptococcus pneumoniae cause a an interference pattern with viruses? And that has not been well studied. And uh, I guess from a first principles view, I'm not sure that it necessarily would. However, some people have speculated that um, the sort of uh, uh, immunological response even to a bacterial infection may either augment or impair the ability to fight off a virus because different arms of the immune system are invoked during bacterial infections uh, versus viral infections. So I think the answer to the question is we are uncertain. Uh, it's certainly viral to viral interference has been more studied than bacterial viral interference. So uh, I, I, I would just leave it as, uh, I guess we really don't know what the answer is, unless Dr. Harrison knows, because she might be smarter than me. I think she is actually. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sorry, I was muted. Um, I don't have much to add. I'm, I'm going to leave that one with Dr. Evans and Mike there. Okay, we'll move on to the next question, which uh, goes back to infection uh, prevention and control. Wouldn't uh, gloves be recommended to prevent contact transmission while immunizing? Uh, well, I think this really um, highlights the importance of hand hygiene and, and hand washing. So uh, gl gloves are, are not required for prevention of COVID-19 transmission when you're uh, immunizing uh, healthy individuals. But, you know, it, it's remiss of me in any of the comments to have said continuous masking, uh, because really uh, what we're talking about is continuous masking coupled with hand hygiene. So, so it's absolutely important that hands are washed. They're washed effectively according to our national or World Health Organization guidelines. So you want to be covering all surfaces, you know, including the thinner eminences and, and uh, focusing on uh, under the nails at proper hand wash, 20 seconds minimum with either alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. So if you're doing that, you shouldn't need gloves for a routine immunization um, and particularly hoping our patients are asymptomatic because we've screened them. Okay, thank you. Along the same lines, in case of having to perform CPR after anaphylaxis, what are the guidelines in terms of PPE for healthcare provider and should a, a PPE type uh, like equipment be put over the victim? So, uh, well, so I'll take this one, but maybe I can also leverage the panel here for comments, but uh, I'll just say that um, th this is a really good time to review all of our basics that we've been doing for years and, and make sure that every single uh, provider in our immunization clinics are up to date. So what do we do uh, you know, in our jurisdiction, in our clinic, when we have anaphylaxis or CPR. I think this question uh, hones in in particular on uh, what some would term source control. And so, you know, there are international guidance. Uh, if you look at say uh, cardiovascular society guidance that talk about source control. So placing a mask over um, a person who is down, if you will, during a resuscitation does have some benefits in containing um, uh, secretion or vomitus. You know, these things uh, can be protective generally, not just for COVID-19. Um, so it, it's worth reviewing whether that's part of the policy in your clinic and, and what, what you think about implementing that measure if, if you haven't specifically addressed that. So I, I think that was the question in there. Um, certainly clinics do need to have personal protective equipment on hand for any communicable disease emergency that can come up. And, you know, we, we talk about pre-screening, but of course we know sometimes we learn or, or see signs or symptoms of the person in front of us to say, my goodness, there's some risk here. And, and now we've got a person down. So part of routine precautions is that point of care risk assessment. What do I need to put on to protect myself and others and, and go from there? But to the point of source control, uh, yes, there are some recommendations uh, for that. And you can look at what your own setting has in place. I don't know if anyone, um, if Dr. Evans or Dr. Gemma have anything to add to that. From my point of view, Robin, thank you. I would like to just point out that we have about four minutes left. So I would like uh, all panelists to please uh, scan through the questions and if you can provide written answers to some uh, questions uh, that uh, can be provided in write writing, that would be helpful. We do have uh, 28 comments or questions that we haven't been able to get to, but I would like to uh, 
pose a few more questions for you uh, while um, I still have you on. One question that caught my eye here, do you expect any um, peculiarities in, not in First Nations communities that differ from the general population this flu season? And do you have any advice for these communities that differ from the general population? Well, I guess I can start by saying that uh, Indigenous uh, people are, uh, are on the list uh, of uh, and that's your recommendations this year, as they have been uh, since I think the pandemic of 2009. And this was based on the fact that uh, uh, early on in that pandemic, and I think it was primarily in Manitoba, but it may have been in other provinces as well, that a number of uh, individuals uh, had to be uh, medevaced and ended up on ventilators uh, with H1N1, particularly um, uh, uh, people that uh, might have been, as you know, uh, younger uh, as uh, H1N1 uh, tended to affect uh, uh, younger people um, in, in that pandemic of 2009. So that, that I don't think there's anything new or anything um, um, uh, particularly uh, different that uh, uh, we need to say at this point in time, uh, except to say that uh, the Massey recommendation that all people uh, are, are not eligible from a provincial point of view, but it's recommended that all uh, people uh, in Canada who wish to reduce their risk of influenza vaccine uh, do so, and um, that could be in a provincial program, uh, such as Ontario and a few other provinces that have got a universal program, or uh, people who wish to, who live in provinces who do not have a universal program who wish to purchase uh, the, the, the uh, vaccine. Uh, so uh, yes, um, a, a benefit, I think, uh, in those communities, like every other community in the I will, uh, I see Dr. Gerald Evans uh, wanting to add to your comments. Yeah, I just, I just want to throw in, we, we know from 2009 and subsequently that uh, indigenous populations around the world have a higher risk for more severe complicated influenza than non-indigenous communities. So in fact, uh, I certainly would stress that, uh, that uh, an indigenous community should look at very high influenza uh, vaccine uptake rates because uh, there's a clear benefit to influenza vaccine um, uh, more so even in the product or in the reduction in serious and complicated influenza, even if it doesn't prevent you from getting influenza, the likelihood you're going to go on to more serious, complicated diseases reduced. So I, I think it's an important message to drive home. Uh, and that's been universal around the world with indigenous communities. They should get the flu shot. Absolutely. Without question. Thank you very much. We're one minute, uh, till one o'clock here in Winnipeg and, um, Go ahead, Dr. Brown. <laughs> Go ahead. There was one question I wanted to answer live. It was very fast. Somebody was asking, how long do you give unvaccinated staff at uh, long-term care's uh, influenza antivirals if you're using it for post-exposure prophylaxis? So the general recommendation is don't go over 14 days. Uh, generally, it's five to seven days um, in most, but it depends on the length of the outbreak. And typically, you're going to take directions from your local medical officer of health as to uh, you know what duration would be required. But typically, we do not recommend more than 14 days there. I told you it was a short answer. OK, great. Well, uh, we, I have a short snap with you, which is this issue of why do we give four times more uh, uh, antigen to older people uh, when we um, usually give them their medications with caution. And the reason for this is, is there's a concept called immunosenescence. In other words, people's immune systems are not working as well, and they need more stimulation to be able to get a proper or as a, an optimum immune response. Uh, so that's the reason why we give four times more for elderly people is because their immune systems, like other systems in their bodies, are not doing as well as they had in the past and they need more antigen to be able to be protected. So uh, we still have over like 379 attendees online. So if there's any questions that I haven't been able to get to, um, please let me know and we can definitely go over um, sometime if you have, um, if you would like to answer a specific question, I will give you an opportunity to maybe do so. I wouldn't want you to not have an opportunity to address a question that I have missed. So um, maybe just take a few minutes to scan through the questions. I'm trying to. Um, um, I, can, I can tell people that all product monographs uh, for influenza vaccines are available online. You have to uh, use the not just influenza vaccine. You have to use the trade name. Uh, so look at the uh, trade names in the slide that I gave, and then uh, you'll be able to find all of those uh, product monographs uh, online. But I do recommend the NACI statement as the um, singular most important reference for providing influenza vaccine. 
Thank you for commenting on that. There was actually a question regarding whether the post immunization wait time will be made available through NACI statement. And the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll conclude our webinar for today. I would like to thank Dr. Evans, Dr. Harrison, and Dr. Gemmel for um, this was an excellent presentation and we learned a lot. I would like to acknowledge our colleagues at Public Health Agency of Canada for their collaboration on these annual seasonal influenza webinars. A big thanks to my team at NCCID and at the University of Manitoba AD department for their support with this webinar. Thank you for, uh, to all of you for joining us today. We hope the information provided will support you and your practice during this influenza season. Thank you very much and stay safe.